Today we're going to talk about replication. Just to recap, machine learning you need a lot of data and you need a lot of big systems and big expense. So you need a lot of cloud infrastructure and you need a lot of time and attention to collecting of data. So those are huge dependencies. You need big data, a lot of repetition, and you need some big systems. And what it does basically is you look for repetition in data and then you alert somebody or alert a system uh, for, uh, to trigger an event. So that's machine learning. So we can't really get there yet with this discussion because you need a lot of data and a lot of big systems and a lot of big expense before you can even start. So replication is how do you start or begin something in artificial intelligence. So we're not going to talk about machine learning. What about uh, predictive modeling? Well, predictive modeling is very exciting. We're not very sophisticated yet. And this is because uh, technology has not yet hired any psychology students. So why do I say that? So in psychology, there's a huge discipline in statistics to understand the bias of sampling. Because predictive modeling, basically, uh, just to recap, predictive modeling is about taking samples of information or samples of data and then using that to generalize to a, a greater population or to generalize a trend. So you're, you're starting with samples and you do something with those samples. Well, those samples themselves need to be analyzed so that you have high confidence it actually is the sample it's suggesting it is. You need a psychology student or uh, somebody who has an appetite and a discipline to um, analyze the bias of things. And how do you do that effectively? Well, you kind of have to not just sit with the data you have, but try to find things that aren't in the data or try to find things that you can't see. And with that analysis, that's where you find bias of things. If something is not in your data set, then you can suggest maybe the sample is biased and, and then it gives you more confidence to know if something's biased, you can incorporate that into your generalization. Okay, I'm talking too much, but basically with predictive modeling, you kind of need to have a lot more analysis on your sampling. So, um, so we're not there yet in this discussion because we're, still, we're just beginning something. Appetite for technology is about how to begin something or to start a capability. Okay, so predictive modeling is not going to be part of this discussion. Okay, so what about automation? Well, automation, as I went through in the other video, is more about a strategy on how to trigger an event and find a way to trigger that event automatically, either from a schedule or from an output of another event. And then basically with that, you can have multiple events chained together where each event is triggering the next event. So one event, the output of one event can be a trigger for another event that's looking for that output to trigger another event, to trigger another event. And you got a chain of events. And then when you've chained them, not only do you have a one-off automation capability, but you've actually produced a very intricate, sophisticated automation flow. And then you can suggest that's artificially intelligent. Now, we can't have that in today's discussion because we're just going to talk about building a capability from scratch or, or starting something. And you can have some, autom auto obviously there's gonna be automation incorporated within it, but automation is not the main focus. We're gonna talk about replication first, and then we can get an automation in another video on how to replicate using automation. <laughs> okay, but let's try to understand what replication is. So what is replication? So Synapse Chain, for example, um, it has replicated something and then it has reassembled it. So what do I mean by that? So we'll go through the video today. We'll, we'll, I'll do some hands-on for you and I'll show you how you can replicate something. You break it down, you break it down into units, which units meaning a unit is a sub capability or a sub process uh, or a sub representation of something and you define those units. So you break down the units, you break down an experience into units, and then once you've defined all those units, you basically just figure out how to reassemble those units back to something you've replicated. Um, but the idea there is you want to replicate 
when you're reassembling the units of something you replicated, as you reassemble, you want to try to produce a new capability or a new experience that has not yet been sought or not yet been well understood and then you internalize that. So let's first let's talk about what replication is, um, kind of why it's compelling in, in artificial intelligence. Well, replication is a part of us. If you look at comparative psychology, comparative psychology is all about looking at plants or animals and understanding those behaviors and comparing to our own psychology. And you'll notice there's, there's some mimicking or there's some parallels that are mimicked or replicated. Um, also in our own psychology, if you look, let's say you look at development psychology, um, as children develop, there's some patterns where they're mimicking um, um, their parents or mi mimicking behaviors that they see in schools, etc. And, and then they're able to internalize those experiences and grow and, and learn. Um, here's, a, here's one big example for replication. So let's say we have a celebrity who posts an event or posts, posts an inspirational message. Well, if we have a, a fan or an audience that looks up to the celebrity, they might not be able to readily critically understand the message or the behavior, um, but they're more so likely to replicate that behavior or message or internalize it in some way. And the reason for that is they want to experience what that message is so they can internalize it. And then once they internalize it, they can break down what it is and then they can incorporate that into their goals or into their own capabilities. So a celebrity uh, might have a message, um, somebody replicates that or, or tries to interpret that by internalizing it and repeating it in some way. And then they internalize that experience and then they use that information to, um, to move forward in a, in a compelling fashion. So, the reason why I'm bringing this up with this example is to suggest replication is a part of us. It is, it is just something that we do, um, something we're very good at. So why don't we incorporate this into artificial intelligent designs? So that's what this video is about. So I'm going to go through an example of how Synapse Chain performs replication in how it will take an experience, break it down into units, define those units, and then reassemble those units. And the compelling part of that is in that process, when you have these defined units, you can actually analyze those units. You can find or analyze the significance of those units. And as you're reassembling, you can produce different experiences by uh, highlighting some of those units that are more compelling or more significant, and then not putting as much significance to other units of that experience. And from that, you basically can, can take a common experience and you can express it in different ways to different audiences and then even to a, a, a particular audience who is in a particular mood at a particular time can have some aspect of that experience highlighted to them, discarding other aspects of the units that are assembled so that the unit, the, that same experience might change based on somebody's mood, might change based on um, certain segments of a population, etc. So there's, there's a lot of potential with replication in artificial intelligence, but we're just going to break it down very simple. So we're just going to go through one simple example so that we can understand um, how, how uh, this be can become part of a, a discipline in artificial intelligence. Okay, so are you ready? We'll go through an example. It's going to be very simple. Today, just focus on replication. Okay, let's go. We have some code here, and this is very simple, just is a hello. So let's look at this very quickly, just to see what it looks like. You can see that it's just rendering hello. Now, the idea is uh, we want to code things, right? So what we're doing with um, this aspect of artificial intelligent replication is we want to circumvent all those costs and all that overhead to reinvent the wheel of using these pre-built capabilities where we can control uh, what we want to replicate ourselves. So what we're going to do today is just replicate an experience and we're going to express it in this code here. But what's going to be nice is you're not going to actually be doing any coding. So don't worry if it seems complicated, we're not actually going to be doing coding. 
we're going to make our lives so much easier where we don't have to code, but we can still benefit from code of some sort. This is a replication process, okay? All right, so first let's go to our target source. What is our source? So I chose a source, which is the W3C Consortium. This is really the inspiration of the internet. What I wanted to do was I wanted to replicate the W3C web page because I consider W3C to be the most standardized web page out there. It has like from a common denominator perspective, it has all those capabilities that are have been standardized. Yeah, there are some more, there's some other web pages that have something a little bit more sophisticated and more leading edge. We'll get in those aspects in other videos for now. Let's just replicate W3C. So how do we do that? Let's go through the first step and we're just going to hit this web page w3.org. We're going to start replicating by inspecting the page. So basically when you hit the page, you just right click and then on your browser, you just select inspect. What that does is it brings up uh, like a, you know, a development console that contains all kinds of um, aspects of your experience, aspects of the web experience, and you can look at certain aspects of it. And really what we're looking at is just the elements component of it. So we're just going to focus only on the, on, on trying to pull the source of, of this experience. So what we do is we just highlight the HTML on the page. As you can see, uh, this entire experience, this page is, is all markup and we're going to highlight the root of the markup. The root is the HTML markup. We're going to highlight that. We're going to right click on the HTML once it's highlighted, and then we're going to select copy outer HTML. What that does is it, when we, we just click that and what it does is it places all of that markup into memory. Okay. So we have it in our memory and clipboard. And now that we have in memory, we're going to move over to our text editor and we're going to actually replace all of this by highlighting everything. And then we're going to paste what's in our clipboards. We're pasting what we just added um, from our, uh, our source. So I'm pasting all that in. So as you can see, this is everything. This is all the markup that was taken from um, our source target. And you can see it's all a bunch of HTML. And additionally, we'll go back to the web page and we will also copy this doc type. So right here, this doc type, let's just copy this. So in our browser, there's an edit menu option in our browser and we're just going to copy. We're going to click edit and then we're going to click copy to copy that doc type and we're just going to paste it in at the top. So let's just do that really quick. And we just do this for completeness. We don't need this for much. We can just, we can just put doc type HTML and we're just as happy, but we're just, because this is from a source, we're going to take it. We're going to contain it into the same page. So now our replication HTML has basically replicated all of that information that came from the source. So here we're going to save this. So once we save this, uh, we're going to go to our replication HTML. Remember it was originally saying hello. Well, this is what was rendered before when we loaded this. And this was just our starter page, our starter page. We just called it replication HTML and saved it in our desktop. This is loaded in our browser. And what we're going to do is just refresh the browser to refresh what we just saved. Okay. So we're refreshing. And now that you can see the result, you can see what's being rendered. What's being rendered is the markup from W3C, but this is kind of boring. It uh, looks vertical in all of its content. There's no layout. Where's those images? And look, some of these header links, they look kind of funny and you're missing like, you're just missing some essential things. What we want is we want the full experience. If we go back to our original web page, let's bring this out and this is what our original experience looks like. Why can't we just replicate this? Why does it look so funny? Well, the easy way to do this, and this is what we code into our artificial intelligent replication is what we do is we contain all of this markup in memory and we persist it in, in somewhere. And then quite easily, all we do is we just add an, uh, one additional tag. We inject this. So what we do is we inject base href. You see base href. Let's close this. So base href. 
And what we do is we go to our original source and we get that URL and that URL is from W3C. So we just basically put that reference from the location bar reference that URL. We put that URL into the base href here. We just inject it as um, a value of this attribute href. And we're going to save this and this is going to be our base reference for all of this content. So let's do that. Let's save this. Now when we go back to our web page, I haven't re refreshed this yet. Now remember we we loaded this when we took the raw markup. So you have to imagine we have an artificial intelligence program. We just went to a source, pulled the source, and we loaded that. This is what we get. Now what we did is our artificial intelligence program is injecting the base reference, the base reference that we just added and it's going to put the base reference of the location of our source and we just added that and now we're just going to refresh this and when we refresh this we should get a one-to-one -one replication so let's refresh boom you see this we have a one-to-one -one replication so this is how you start a replication you want to achieve a one-to-one -one likeness of your replication behavior so the idea is you, you look at a source. I mean, if you're doing this through the web, there's so many other things we could replicate with respect of this video. We want to make things so simple. We're only replicating what is on the web. So we're re replicating an existing web page or an existing web experience. And we're bringing that over. And now this replication HTML, it wonderfully looks like it's just a one-to-one -one of what that experience was that we saw on the actual web page. Isn't this wonderful? So what we would like to do from here is disassemble the units, disassemble all the units of this experience and then reassemble it, but reassemble it in dynamic ways that makes it interesting, compelling, that can target users, can target systems, can target a mood, depending on the variables that we can put weight on as something that has more value in one unit that could increase the experience rate over another unit. So let's do that. So let's break down this experience into units. So you see here in the markup, we're going back to the markup and the replication HTML. See here's a replication HTML. We pulled this from somewhere. All we did was simply add in the base, remember? And so then what we do is, well, the first step is breaking it up into units. So we have to understand what we're breaking up. So the idea here is we want to break this up into units. Um, so let's do that by first breaking up the head. So, so the head is in an HTML page, the header is where everything is initially loaded before the body is generated. So we want to load that what's called the dependencies. So these are the dependencies. So let's just, let's just reduce that. So we, so I'm using Atom, so I'm just using Atom from Atom.io, and it's just a text editor, and it allows me to basically reach out within my markup to find a starting tag and an ending tag. So in HTML, you have a start tag, end tag, and then anything embedded within that start tag, end tag is a whole bunch of markup that represents um, uh, the makeup of, of that area, that, that component, right? So we're gonna, we're going to reduce that by collapsing it. See this expand collapse. We're going to expand collapse, expand. We're collapsing the head, right? We're collapsing it down. And what we do in an artificial intelligent program is we add this to memory. So we basically take this information and we, we, we uh, persist it somewhere and we just leave it alone. We just leave it to the side and just say, we'll deal with this later. We got you. Okay. Head we'll take, we'll take account of you and we'll deal with you later. Now we move down to the body and we notice that in the body, um, the body really is uh, the main aspect of the experience. So if we go back to our web page, we notice that this is our body. So everything in the head we don't see because that's the dependencies, remember? This is the actual experience that we actually visually see. This is what we visually experience. So that is everything in the body area. See all this? See how there's like 370 lines, 21 to 370 is a whole bunch of markup for the body. Okay, great. So from here, what we do is we reduce that and collapse it. 
So what we do then is once it's collapsed, we basically know that anything embedded within this is part of the body. We persist this. We persist this somewhere. We attribute it as the body. So now we've pulled the W3C experience. We've persisted the head and we persisted the body. Well, once we persist the body, what we would like to do is break that down into its subunits. So there's subunits of, of the body. The subunits are usually, let's look here, let's break down the subunits. So what we do is in the body, we right under the body, we take the first div and we reduce that. So we collapse that. And then once we collapse the first div, that's going to collapse everything in a, as a children under that or all its subunits. And we're going to just collapse that. And then what we see is another set of other things. And we simply just take the next set of something and we just reduce that. And then we basically take the next set of whatever that is and reduce that. So you can see the reduction has uh, resulted in three main areas of concern of what we need to focus on. In the body, there are three areas that are subunits. And generally, a web page has a container or a header a content area or a container a footer area and a script area. So this is nice. So what we do is we take these sets of divs and we add this to memory. So we, we basically annotate these sections, persist them. And then when we, when we persist them, we annotate these sections as representing the container, the footer and the scripts. Great. So what do we do from here? Well, then in the container, Let's, let, let's move up, let's, let's keep footer collapsed, let's keep scripts collapsed, let's focus on container for now. Because what we're going to do now is disassemble the container, then we're going to reassemble it. So the container, so we're disassembling container. From here we have, let's take the, the next div, or any tag, we take the next anything under the container as the, what we consider the child thereof, and we just collapse that. And we notice that we just clapped some major section that's called the mast or has a naming convention, the mast, which here you can even easily see in the comments is a header. And then underneath that, there's another div that's not yet collapsed. And we're going to collapse that area. And we're going to see that that is collapsed as the main. So it's just the naming convention they used. One is mast, masthead. One is main, the main area of content. Okay. So what we do here now is we take these sections and we persist that in memory or <laughs> we persist it somewhere and we annotate it as the masthead or the header in the content section or the main. We're annotating it, just at least we have some context to it is basically the goal. Okay, so now we have this unit broken down and what we'd like to do is just change around the masthead. Let's have some fun and let's change around the masthead. Okay, great. So in the mast area, we notice there is an H1 section and it's, it's basically open and closed in one line. So that's great. We don't have to collapse it. But then we notice there's a navigation section. Let's have some fun here. Let's collapse nav. And in our mast, we notice that there's an H1 and then a nav. We want to have fun today and we want to move this somewhere else because we have broken down this area and we have recognized and annotated this area we saved the h1 and all of its content therein into memory we annotated it with h with um, with the logo you can see it's a logo here so we we have somehow pattern matched to know it's the logo we've annotated this as the logo section now once it's in uh, memory and we've broken down all of these units we want to reassemble our experience and reproduce a different experience. So follow me here, I'm doing it manually, but this is how the program works. We basically cut out the H1, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it after the nav. So you see? So instead of the H1 being before the navigation, we're putting the H1 or the logo after the navigation. So I'm gonna save this, and let's just take a quick look to see how that has resulted. So, I'm gonna, so this is our original um, point in time where we have 
basically just one for one replicated W3C. Now we're going, now I've made a change where I've moved the H1 section or the logo below the navigation. And now I'm just about to refresh it. Okay, so I'm gonna refresh the browser. And when I refresh the browser, you see a dramatic change. Now you see the W3C underneath, this logo is now underneath the navigation. Okay, well, isn't that wonderful? So we have changed the experience. And what we really did, let's recap really quick before we make more, some more changes. We replicated W3C, one for one. Once we replicated, we broke down the components into units. We started from you know, the header and then the, the body, and then we basically broke down within the components of the body. We found that there's a masthead, we found that there was a main section, and then within the masthead, we found that there was an H1 and a navigation. And then what we did was we moved, we switched the, the uh, logo um, that was originally before the navigation, we moved the logo after the navigation, as you can see. Okay, so this doesn't look good right now though, because we have um, like some marketing material here and it's filling up a lot of space and it doesn't look good if we keep it at the top because generally when we look at web pages we usually see this navigation flush at the top and then we see a nice logo below it so let's let's try to replicate that so all we need to do is um, we just now need to focus on this this navigation section and just figure out how to clean it up so let's do that in the code and basically we're going to search for um, that content section uh, leading the web to its full potential, which is so inspiring, which is why W3C has been inspiring all these years. And they are leading the web to its full potential. It's amazing. So, but the, for the point of this discussion, what we want to do is disassemble this, maybe make some changes to change that experience to make it more compelling. Now that we found that section, we're going to easily right now we're just going to remove it. So I just removed it and I'm saving what I removed, right? You got to think in terms of an artificial intelligent program, this has already been scripted and structured. We have like a generic replication uh, format and process. So think of terms of the programs doing this for us. We're just doing it manually for purposes to understand. So I just deleted something. I just de deleted a section that I knew was that referenced or represented something, I, I, was, I felt I could easily delete it. So let's see what happens after we delete it. I already deleted it. We're gonna go back to the web page, And now that I deleted it, you see this is what was originally here. Now I'm, gonna, I'm about to refresh the web page to refresh what I just deleted. So I'm gonna hit refresh. And you see that top section is gone. You see now, now we have um, made some adjustments to something we replicated and we produced a new experience, something more compelling based on some factors we've assessed and we've assessed, yeah, maybe if we move the navigation above the logo, maybe we don't need some of that marketing material in the section of the nav um, because we don't need that real estate that needs to be accommodated for that type of layout we have a different layout now, and because that layout has changed, we know we need to change some units of the experience that we've reassembled, and now that we've reassembled, we've made a different experience that might be compelling to some people, but the other experience might be, might be nice for other people. But the idea is we can easily adjust our experience based on our audience, based on a mood, based on anything. This is, this is an aspect of artificial intelligence that is going to become a trend and it's all coming from this video because this is really this video is is really um, the first video you'll ever see on artificial intelligent replication um, even though it's innate in us it's very natural for us the reason why we haven't talked about replication is because we never realize that that is a program that we follow we are actually a set of programs that we follow we just don't know and you know, what's interesting about that is a lot of things we do, we replicate and mimic, but we're always looking at the end result or the, the superficial aspect of something. And we don't really critically think about the process. 
So yeah, I just wanted to show an example where I simply just broke down um, something that looks complex. So there's a lot of coding here and it looks very complex up front, but there's a way to simplify things where you just annotate things and you just understand things by breaking it down to, into units and then you place those units into memory or, or you persist those units with some annotation. And instead of worrying about the complexity, you simplify things by breaking down the units and then it makes it easier to reassemble those units and you can produce a better experience. Okay, so this is Synapse Chain. The inspiration behind this is that we want to look at existing things. We want to look at existing experiences. We want to replicate those, but we want to break it down into the units and then reassemble them. And then when we, when we reassemble them, we want to do it in a cost-effective way. If you look at what's innate in ourselves and try to harness that and, and include that into your design, you can come up with something more effective. And then at the same time, you aren't tied to a, a lot of these um, burdens of, of having to, you know, um, embed your, your design to be, you know, so highly dependent on all these high costs, high expense, um, client server, client server, client server, everywhere um, <laughs> solutions. There are ways to do things effectively and simply. And that's the idea is what I just showed you is just an, a simple way to break things down and we're using the art of, of replication. I hope you gained some insight into um, you know, how to easily uh, replicate uh, behavior and how to break it down into units. So this was done manually for us so we could break it down very simple with very simple steps. This is the process what we do when we are coding um, our program. So we basically everything you saw here, as I was saying, you, you highlight things, you find um, some, some aspect of it that's meaningful and you persist that and then you persist all these units and then once you persist all these units, they become separate uni units and then you, want, you can easily reassemble them. I hope you enjoyed the video. We'll have some other videos coming out and have a great day. Thank you.